Dr. Doug Lucas here, retired orthopedic surgeon, now focusing my practice on longevity and bone health. If you've been diagnosed with osteoporosis or osteopenia, and you are using DEXA scans with your doctor to help determine whether or not what you're doing is working for you, you definitely wanna watch this video because DEXA scans, while they do have some value, do not tell the whole story. And there are some better markers that we can use to help to determine if what you're doing for your bone health is working for you. All right, so here's the thing with DEXA. So doctors use DEXA on a regular basis to help determine if you are responding to your drug therapy or if you're watching your bone health and we're watching it get worse because we're not treating it with anything, they'll continue to use DEXA on a yearly or, or bi-yearly basis to help to determine the progress of your bone density. Now I have an entire video on DEXA, but let me just summarize here, which is DEXA is a reasonable tool that looks at the mineralization of your bone. But let's be clear on what it is. It is simply a measure of your bone density. It is a measure of the amount of mineral in your bone. And if your treatment is aimed at improving that mineralization, then yeah, your DEXA will go up. Here's the downside. DEXA is not a measure of strength. It is not a measure of bone quality. So we can get misled by DEXA. So I've been talking about this for a long time because while DEXA does have some benefit, there are weaknesses and there's a new study that I'm gonna point out and talk about in this video that shows very clearly how sometimes DEXA can look worse, but strength is getting better. So let me just run you through some of the details of the study. So this is a 2022 study, a very recent study called the Terabit study. And what this did was to look at two different dosing forms of one drug versus bisphosphonates, which is kind of the standard of care uh, for bone loss, or at least the most commonly prescribed drugs. And so what's great about this study is that they not only followed patients with DEXA over six, 12 and 18 months, but what they also did was to use a quantitative CT to determine not only the bony architecture, but also an estimate of strength. So this is really cool technology because without having to actually test a bone to failure, you can get a sense of whether or not the bone is going to withstand a certain amount of stress based off of what you're seeing on CT. Now, if you're wondering, oh my gosh, why don't we just use CT instead of DEXA? Well, the problem with CT is that they are very expensive to do in this way. And there's also a fair amount of radiation. So it's difficult to do this even from a diagnostic perspective or a prognostic perspective. And certainly you wouldn't wanna do it on an annual or biannual basis for the rest of your life because the radiation dose would be too high. That said, we can look at this study to help us to determine if we should be looking at DEXA alone or if we should be using some other markers to help determine our progress in our bone health journey. All right, so what you can see here is that there are three different graphs. Each graph is of a different section of the body, so lumbar spine, total hip, and radius. Now the lumbar spine is very different than the total hip as far as the architecture of the bone. And you can see that both in the lumbar spine and the total hip, all three drugs or drug regimens improved DEXA or bone density. But in the radius, it didn't. They all went down over the course of the study. And so how is that possible? Well, if you look at the bones, they have different architecture. And I have an example of a femur here. And so you can appreciate that even in the femur, when you're talking total hip, you're talking all of the bone around here. You can see on a DEXA, there are actually measurements for the femoral neck. There's the, all kinds of different measurements. The femoral neck is this section, and that has a lot of what's called cortical bone or the outside rim of the bone. Whereas other parts of the femur, like here in the trochanter region, there's a lot of trabecular bone. Same thing is true in the vertebrae. The radius or the wrist bone here is actually more like the femoral neck. There's a lot of cortical bone and drugs are going to have a different impact on trabecular versus cortical bone. So, all right, in the study, they have now determined that DEXA has improved in the lumbar spine and the total hip, but not so much in the radius. Now, what they were then able to do is to go on and do these quantitative CTs and demonstrate what's called a failure load or a strength rating of the bones. Now, unfortunately, they can't do that in the spine and the hip. That would be great if they could, but we can do it in the distal tibia and the radius. Now, the distal tibia is down by the ankle. The radius is here in the arm, like I mentioned earlier. What you can see here is that 
the failure load of the radius actually continues to go up despite the fact that the DEX is going down. So this is a great example of how DEXA can be helpful, but it does not tell the whole story. What we really wanna know is, are we losing bone? Are we gaining bone? And I wanna make sure that our bone metabolism is actually functioning and working. And this is where I struggle with a lot of the bone drugs because a lot of them will cause the actual bone turnover markers, the cells of the bone to stop working altogether, which we know causes problems in the long term. Sorry to interrupt. If you're enjoying this content, please subscribe. The more people that subscribe, the more likely we are to be recommended to other people looking for recommendations on bone health. If you know anybody that would benefit from this information or is looking for information about bone health, please share this with them so that they can continue on their own journey. And lastly, if you wanna learn more about how we manage bone health or if you wanna learn other tips and tricks on your own, please look for the link in the description below and you can sign up for our free masterclass where we'll go through a lot of these tips and tricks on how you can continue to manage your bone health and some of the things that we do that are difficult to do on your own. All right, so I mentioned that DEX is not perfect. For a lot of people, it's all they have, but there are blood markers that we can use to help to determine whether or not our bone is being broken down too quickly or if we're building up quickly enough. And those two markers are P1 and P, and CTX. So I'll start with P1 and P. So P1 and P stands for propeptide of type one procollagen. There's some other names for it, but ultimately this is what we're looking for. What this is, is a breakdown marker of osteoblast function. So if you remember from your reading, osteoblasts are cells that make bone. They are bone builders, osteoblasts, whereas osteoclasts are the ones that break down bone. P1 and P is measuring osteoblast function. So we want P1 and P to be as high as possible. If you look at this sample patient from LabCorp, what you can see here is that the reference interval, which is the statistical average of where P1 and P should be for the age group that they're measuring, goes from 22 to 87. I have seen our without drug approach get people to 90, 100 and above on P1 and P. So I would argue that you could actually exceed that reference interval top end and you could actually be 90 or 100 if you're doing everything you can to improve your bone health. So, all right, so you might be asking yourself the question, well, how do I raise my P1 and P naturally? Well, it's a lot of the stuff that you're probably already doing, but let me hit the highlights for you, which is number one, eating an adequate protein diet really making sure that you're getting all the protein that you need and you're not getting a lot of calories from elsewhere. Number two is going to be the resistance training. Are you able to lift things or do impact that your body can tolerate in a way that you won't get injured? And as always, I say this, be very careful when you start a new program because it is so hard to recover from injury, particularly as we get older. So if you don't know where to start, ask for help. And then third, your body has to be able to both absorb nutrients and be provided with all the nutrients to build bone. If you don't have the right calcium, the magnesium, the vitamin D, the vitamin K, the, all the things, if you don't have them all, then your body can't build bone. Even if your osteoblasts are just revved up, they're not gonna be able to do anything. So you gotta have all of the components to build bone in place and you have to be able to absorb them, which means your gut has to work appropriately. For a lot of people that can take some testing and fine tuning. And then lastly, your hormones have to be optimized. For some people that means replacement, for other people that means using supplementation. There are a lot of different ways to do this, but you probably need to do something to help get these things headed in the right direction. All right, and then the last one I'm gonna talk about is CTX. Now CTX is the biomarker for bone breakdown. So I said that osteoclasts are the cells that break down bone, and osteoclasts, when they're working, will deliver into the blood CTX or C telopeptide. So we can monitor osteoclast function by looking in the blood for this marker CTX. So ultimately what we want to do is to balance CTX with P1 and P. Now you can see here on the lab core reference range, I wish that these were done in the same units. Unfortunately, they're not. So we can't really say that these numbers need to be the same. In fact, they're never going to be the same unless you're on drugs, which is either really jacking up P1 and P or really dropping down CTX, but they don't need to be the same because they're in different units. So when you look at the CTX report here from LabCorp, what you can see is that there are 
both male and female ranges and there are premenopausal and postmenopausal ranges for women. When you get this report from your doctor, if you could order it that way, then you're gonna see a specific range that is for your gender and for your age group. Now, I wanna put a note of caution in here because you can see in this sample report that doesn't have an age in it, that the postmenopausal reference range goes all the way up to over a thousand. Over a thousand is really rapid bone loss. And we shouldn't see over a thousand in anybody who's actively trying to improve their bone health. The question is what's right for you. So I can tell you that on a blanket perspective, for everybody, I like to see this under 600, maybe under 400. Um, it really depends on what's going on with you, with all of the other biomarkers and all the things that we're trying to do. So this is a tough one to tell people where they should be because there are a number of factors that are gonna play into this. But in general, lower is better. And of course, you could talk to your team about where they would expect this to be based on what's happening with you. All right, so how can you slow down CTX? How can you slow down osteoclast function? Well, it's actually all the same things I just said for P1 and P, but there are some very specific things for osteoclast, and this gets really into the, the details of what's appropriate for you versus not for you. Um, so things like estrogen, which as we've talked about in the past, estrogen has an impact on osteoclast, so it will slow down their function. But of course, estrogen is not FDA approved for osteoporosis. So we have to be careful how we say that. But yes, estrogen can have an impact. Whereas testosterone and progesterone are gonna have more of an impact on osteoblasts and can potentially help them to build bone uh, on the other side of this equation. So other things that have an impact on osteoclasts are gonna be things like inflammation, chronic stress, um, inadequate nutrition. So there's a number of things that activate osteoclasts. All of these are part of a comprehensive approach to optimal bone health. All right, so those are my two favorite biomarkers. I'm not saying that DEXA is not good. DEXA does provide some evidence. It's just not the whole picture. And these two biomarkers are really helpful to add that intermediate picture. What's happening at six week, three month, six months intervals, depending on how often you can get them. They're not always easy to get. Sometimes it's gonna be a challenge depending on what's happening in your medical system, if your doctor is resistant to ordering them, if your insurance will pay for them. So this is where working with somebody who can help you to get these or learning more about how you can get them from providers like us would be something that you could consider. If you like this video, please subscribe so more people can view this type of information when they're looking for information on bone health. If you want to learn more about how we manage osteoporosis, look for the link in the description below and you can sign up for our free masterclass where we'll talk about all of these things in more detail. And lastly, I wanna hear from you. I love hearing comments about the videos, any concerns you have about the information that you're seeing. If you disagree, I wanna hear that too. If you have ideas of other topics that you wanna hear, leave them in the comments below. We'll respond to everything generally within 24 hours and we are collecting all the topics, we're making lists and we're doing videos on the most popular ones. So definitely comment below. Thanks again for making it to the end of the video. Thank mm -hmm. you.